expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests and not necessarily those of the staff or management of KLAV. The sport of radio control racing has swept the nation and Vegas RC Raceway is proud to present the first radio show in the nation to cover this rapidly growing sensation. So without further delay, your host Eric Flynn and the Big Shane bring you Radio Control Race Chat. And welcome to the show. I'm Eric. And I'm Big Shane. And this is RC Race Chat. Before we get going here, you can uh, you can call in if you have any questions at uh, 702-731-1230. You can also stream us live from the Vegas RC Raceway website, which is thevrcr.com. Um, we're also on iTunes. You can check us out there. And uh, we got a big show, huh, Shane? Yes, we do. Yes, Go, we do. Got Teakin, a, Teakin. That's Teakin. right. Teakin, Teakin, Teakin. We're going to have uh, team manager for Teakin, Randy Pike, on here in about five minutes. But uh, before then, we're going to take a few minutes to uh, catch everyone up on what's been going on this week. Uh, Shane, you just got back from Gas Champs. Yes. How did that go? It was crazy. Uh, the track was insane. Uh, the format was a little uh, cattywampus. That's what you, you had might, said, a little bit different. You might say cattywampus once in a while. Now, was, how, was, how was it different? Um, the way that they started us was completely different. It was a little unorthodox than the normal starting, like, rocket round qualifiers or, you know, you against the clock kind of thing. It was mostly heads-up racing. And uh, the way they lined us up was kind of like a Formula One race. And it was down and quiet every time, even in the qualifiers, which isn't usual. For Normally they nitro. do the, the line and hot. Yeah, the line's hot usually, you know. they. You know, and for the people that don't know, what happens is the guys get out on the track and they start doing a couple practice yeah, you laps, get your that warm kind up of laps. stuff, and they give you a certain amount of minutes until the loop or the transponder loop is hot, and then when the sound goes and loop is hot, as soon as you cross it, then your race starts. Yeah, you can usually pick and choose when you want to you know, leave right. you know, and start At your, your own leisure. race. Yeah. Right, because you're racing against the time, yeah. not each other. Now, how did this differ? This was different because the way th they set you, it was down and quiet, and then you had to you know, have your pit man out there at the same time. And it was tough because we had the Vegas, uh, the Vegas guys there and the Havasu guys there, and we were all trying to help each other out. And it seemed like everybody was in the same race, so it was tough. It was tough to uh, stay on top of it. And uh, it was definitely different. And not only that, but with the way that they started it, you would start – um, down and quiet, and then it would go into a whoop section of about eight whoops and up a hill. And so you're going <laughs> up a hill, and everyone gets yeah. bound up right on oh, top yeah, of each it other. Was, it was crazy. And the track, it, not only that, the track was very challenging, I thought. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not I've the greatest. I've heard that from a few people. Yeah, I'm not the greatest driver in the world, but I know the sportsman guys, uh, I, I heard a lot about it. That it was just really difficult for them. I almost compare it to the same thing as, like, Nitro Challenge. And I actually thought last year's Nitro Challenge was probably a little bit easier than uh, – than this track was because just the, the lanes were a little bit narrower and it, it was just it was a tough race well, that's it was good. tough it's to go to fast yeah though. that's great now how many how many classes did you race there oh i raced i raced three classes and uh it was gas buggy gas truggy and um electric eight scale and how did you fare um in in the in the gas truggy i took third um and then uh with the buggy i think i was fifth and uh with the with the e-buggy i was the first unsponsored driver I mean, I, I didn't win, but I was the first, you know, not Travis Amescu, was not Rhonda Drake, not right. But now that had to be Ryan a, Lutz, and that had to be a pretty special thing because you got to race with what Cavalieri, Cavalieri, and, Brett Thelke, Ryan Lutz, Rhonda Drake. I mean, there's a whole list of, of of pro drivers that were in that class, and I did okay against them. I'm not, I mean, I wasn't the greatest, but I did, I did fairly okay. Now, I thought. I, now you did make it into the A main, which yeah. is exceptional. Now, how did you qualify into the A main? Uh, it was it was tough. But I, I qualified sixth in the on the grid. Now, um, did you uh, in the grid there were all the pro guys ahead of you? Did you sneak in front of a couple? I of think them? I might have got in there against a couple of them, and I think uh, Brett Thelke was one of them. He was, oh, really? Yeah, and he w he wasn't too happy about it, but but uh, he, he was know, a good sport about oh, it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. He's he's actually a great guy. He's he's funny. That's awesome. Well, he's hey, funny. you know, you're moving up the ranks there. You're gonna have to start bumping them off sooner yeah, or later. Yeah, me, the hillbilly from Vegas, is coming up a little bit. There so. you go. Well, you're doing a great <laughs> job. And uh, <laughs> moving on a little bit here before the uh, before the interview with uh, Randy Pike, we're uh, we're still preparing for Havasu. You as well, still uh, still doing the. Uh, the track preparation for that. How's that going? Are you yeah. get, got any ideas down? Yeah, we're we're kind of getting some stuff down. I, me and Jason Miller uh, talked about it over the weekend, and and uh, 
we, we got an idea of what we're going to do. And I talked to the pro-line guys because they're all going to be there. And uh, most of them said, uh, you know, they're all the, the owners and, and, and marketing managers and stuff like that. They said, uh, we don't drive that good, so can you kind of take it easy on us? And I said, oh, well, we'll just come up with a good. Make it interesting for everybody. It's going to be fun, fast, fun, and, and maybe I'll have a couple technical sections in there. But uh, most likely it will not be like uh, – the gas this last one, huh? a no. little bit easier yeah to yeah we'll be able to drive short course and stuff on it so it will be fun awesome it's going to be awesome, awesome. now also i i, I also want to i also want to uh correct myself over last week's show i i said that it was in the 10th uh gas championships and it's it was only the third okay and okay, I, I knew i wasn't there. i knew i wasn't 100 percent correct so it was on the that. third annual the third gas annual champs. gas championship awesome. Thunder Alley, not yeah. the not the biggest mistake nothing to worry no, about no. Um, one thing that the big shane and i here would like to do is throw a shout out to the rcarea.co.uk guys kevin out there they've been uh, absolutely wonderful helping us out with uh getting this the show out there yeah. sure shane will agree uh, we were on their front page twice in the past week, as well as Neo Buggy. Yeah, they've been repping us a lot, and uh, and now Neo Buggy. Now we're on Neo Buggy, so that's that's putting the word out there. I think we're getting out there, and uh, not only that, but this weekend I I rapped to a lot of people and told them you know about about our show, and and they were thrilled to hear about something different. You know, it's not just uh, you know right. The we're internet, the first ones out know. there. You know, live live radio is where it's at now. Wonderful. Well, looks like we have a special caller on the phone here, Randy Pike from Teakin. How you doing, bud? Good, man. How are you? Very well, thank you. How's uh, how you doing tonight? Uh, what's going on? Uh, just trying to wrap up a couple projects we're working on, and then uh, trying to prepare to make sure I can uh, be left alone for the interview. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's always awesome. tough to do to put an hour aside. Yeah, yeah, it can be a little. Yeah. How you been, there. Randy? I haven't seen you since uh, Silver State. I think it was was the last time we yeah, saw I've each been- other. This I've is been good, man. I'm just uh, traveling some of the races, working on a lot of projects, and trying to do a lot of testing. So, so I've been busy, but uh, busy's good. Yeah, it is. It's, at least you're working. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Uh, well, now, Randy, for some of the listeners that might know exactly who you are and what you do, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Okay. Uh, my name is Randy Pike. I am the team manager for Team Teak and Electronics. Uh, I do all the team management stuff as well as marketing and uh, project uh, development. I've been doing it for about, I've uh, been on the team since 2004, and I started working as, in the team manager's position in the end of 2006. Oh, awesome. So you've been there quite some time. That's, uh, that's neat to be able to say you've been at a place for so long. And um, so it sounds like you've been in the hobby for quite some time. How old were you when you got into the hobby, and, uh, and how long before the, uh, the racing bug got you? Oh, wow. Um, I was always into RC cars as a kid, but my first hobby-grade kit uh, I think I got when I was 13. And so, yes, I've been in this for a little while, uh, off and on like most guys and stuff like that, but um, always seem to gravitate back to it, and I've been working in the industry since, so uh, a lot of fun. I mean, it's really, you know, I'm very passionate about the hobby. I like almost all aspects of it, so, uh, yeah, it's a great place to work. That's awesome. That's super cool. Now, um, what was your first RC car? Was it an electric one, or was it nitro? What, what were you rocking out there? Uh, my first car was the uh, Tamiya Subaru Barat kit, and uh, it was funny uh, you bring that up because... I was having a conversation with Fred Metal from Tamiya at one point, and uh, he, I was saying, hey, dude, if you guys ever, at the point that Tamiya was re- remaking all of their older kits, and I said, if you guys ever make this kit, please set one aside for me so I can get one. So that was my first RC car, and no, no more than probably three weeks later, uh, the one showed up on my doorstep, which is really cool. He I sent mean, you the vintage brat? Just, oh, yeah, vintage brat. That's brat. awesome. Yeah, it was That's a remake awesome. kit, but it was still really cool because, I mean, all the parts are just everything I remember, the screws, yeah. the bags, the body, what? I mean, yeah, it was really cool. I uh, took my daughter. She's uh, 13, and me and her built it in about a, down two days or so. So it was a lot of fun. That's cool. Very cool, very cool. It looks like, uh, Shane, you have a question here. Yeah, which track was your home track, and do you still find time to visit there now? Uh, my home track when I was a kid or home track now? Both. Both, yeah. Um, home track as a kid was a local um, like BMX park that had a side off to the area. Uh, it closed down probably a couple years after. Uh, I was into the hobby, so probably when I was about 15, 16, and that whole thing is gone now. It's all housing, I'm sure. Um, and then the local home track, uh, we're racing at LSR and uh, A Mains track, which is Outback Raceway. And I try to visit all of those tracks depending on what I'm doing for testing or, or where I'm, you know, what I need to do for just club racing. It's it's pretty much most of the time LSR right now. That's that's pretty cool to have uh, A Mains track at your back door. That's, uh, yeah, the Outback awesome. Raceway is a pretty cool place. I mean, it's you know you got air conditioned pit areas, Wi-Fi, 
you know, it's a really high bite traction clay track that's really, really consistent, uh, really nice driver stand, sound system, the whole nine. I mean, it's, it's you know, A-Main's got a very, very nice track and facility out there. So, yeah, if you ever get a chance to race there, definitely stop by. And I, I've heard cool a, because I've heard a lot about oh, A-Main I, hobbies and, and, and the way that they run their show there, and it's, it's pretty off the yeah. hook, yeah. Good. Yeah, absolutely, top notch over there. Yeah, and they got I, all the parts you need, too. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely right. Now, um, when you when you started club racing and that kind of stuff, you moved up to bigger races. I'm assuming here with your job title and what what was the first big race that you went to? Oh wow, um, my pro the, the, my probably my very first big travel race would be a hot rod shootout. Probably back in oh, 2002, maybe. Yeah, um, I actually uh, was lucky enough to know Matt Francis and. Uh, I wasn't planning on going, and uh, he kind of talked me into it last minute, and I uh, we just drove down there and entered in some random stock class and pretty much got my butt whooped, but it was still fun. I mean, it, was a, it was a good experience because I had never traveled to an RC event, and that was actually like a, you know, a great distance. You know, local club races here and there, but nothing that far away at that point because that was probably a six- or seven-hour drive down to Southern California. Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's quite a haul there. Now, did you, did you head down with friends, or was it you just met Matt Francis down there? I mean, how did that go? Uh, we pretty much followed Matt down there. Uh, my wife was in, uh, just hanging out and, and kind of along for the ride. So I knew a lot of guys that were already planning to go to the race. But like I said, I, for me, it was totally last minute. You know, I wasn't prepared for that race. I mean, I literally just threw all my stuff in the back of my truck and went down. So it was pretty cool. When you got there, were you surprised how fast the guys were in stock class? Oh, my gosh, yeah. I mean, this is exactly <laughs> it's like, it's like you and... thought you were fast, and then you went, you went to California and you raced for your first race, and, and you realized how fast even the stock class was. Like, I know that those guys are phenomenal. Now, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably a little bit of a different ball game, and, and there's a lot more people involved in the sport. But still, I mean, even then, I mean, people that enter stock. They, yeah, the stock class tends to. They're still to... cream of the crop. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't mean just because they have a slower car that they're slower drivers. I mean, there's they're Yeah, the skill's fast. still there. Yeah. It's just the motor yeah that separate do you agree now. with that randy oh absolutely i mean even back then you know with brushed motors and round cells and and i was you know again like you said at the local level i was you know top three four five yeah, depending on any it. given yeah. weekend and yeah. what i was running but go down there and, and it was funny because matt insisted that i run the expert class and i was <laughs> obviously hesitant because i this is my first big race dude really the expert class yeah wow and he's like dude, if i'm wow. getting you in here you got to run expert and i was in like the f main I mean, I, I was nowhere near where I, where I expected to be, and it was, you know, a new track, new surface. I mean, this was, you know, I'd just never seen a track with so much traction at the time. And it was it was cool, but frustrating at the same time. Cause, Very you know, frustrating for you, huh? Yeah. But dude, down in Southern California, they're so deep. I mean, it, it's literally the hub of RC. It is. It so, is. So, you know, it's, it's the, the competition's thick. It, it, there's a lot of guys down there that are fast. Yeah, it seems like everyone that comes out of California is very fast because they have so many places yeah. to go to all the time. I mean, everything, there's probably 10 tracks all within an hour of each other. And that's, if you can keep up on all of those tracks and keep traveling to every one of them, you're going to be good. I mean, you're going to. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, for sure. You get the skill yeah. levels from all different angles. So. Yeah, and, and I mean, they have the tracks as, as far as quantity goes. They've got quality tracks. There's always a race at one of the tracks, and then they've got the weather. So they pretty much get to race year-round. You know, they're not stuck to an indoor track. Like, like I'm in Northern California, but I still get rain. And, we, you know, as soon as the rain season starts, you know, in, in November, the outdoor tracks are done. They, they close them up, and, and we don't race them until, you know, end of April or something to the next year. So everyone, you know, travels indoors. Yeah. So, for, like, for me to go to a big eight-scale track or a big eight-scale race, I'm out of practice. Because they have nowhere to practice eight scale at. You know, we don't have a giant eight scale indoor track. That sounds exactly like my situation at the given moment. Like we don't really have a very good eight scale track in this town, and uh, it'd be really nice to have something. You know, uh, it's in the works. Yeah. So yeah, uh, absolutely. You'd uh, you'd be pretty interested in this here, Randy. I've actually put a bid in on a building, forty three thousand square feet. I'm going to be doing uh, indoor nitro and then indoor ten scale, a big track, and then indoor asphalt on road. So Tekin might have to make the move down to do some testing down yeah. at the Vegas this RC is, Raceway. We're going to try to build the cream of the crop facility in this town. And I think Very because cool. it's Vegas, people are going to come and travel. And then they're going to want to come here now and uh, to come to a big race. You know, just like IIC and all the rest of these big races, Silver State, stuff that happens here in oh, this yeah. town. They're definitely going to come here now. And th we'll have a place year-round to go to. So, And uh, I think that's what everybody's looking forward to. Yeah, I would yeah. agree. I got one. I got a question for you here, Randy. Um, how yeah. how did you become involved with Tekin, and how how did uh, Tekin bring you on board? I mean, like, what what did it take? Like, what happened? 
Uh, let's see. I, at the time, I was uh, I had just opened up a hobby shop, and so we were going to a lot of the trade shows. Um, you know, uh, the the iHobby Expo. The the back in the days, there was another trade show down in Southern California, along with the uh, the uh, oh, what's the one that RC Car Action throws off now? I'm, I'm drawing a blank at the, the moment. RC, but, uh, the RCX. RCX. You know, RC Expo, correct? Yeah. And, and back in the days, uh, the RC Expo actually had. Uh, two days for dealers only, and then it opened up to the public. And so at the time, uh, we went down for the dealer day, me and my wife, and just kind of checking out all the new products and, and meeting all the distributors and, and kind of doing that thing. And that's where I actually met Jim and Sherry Campbell from Tekin. They had just bought the company. It was one of their first trade shows and kind of talked to them a little bit about it. And, uh, again, I hate to bring them up again, but at the time we were kind of walking around with Matt Francis and, and uh, just happened to, you know, make contact. And I introduced Matt and, and to Jim and Sherry and uh, kind of went over from that point on and and uh, met them shook hands you know exchanged business cards and and uh, kind of went down well you know went down from there and uh they were looking for team drivers um and just to get some honest feedback because so they had a lot of old products they were trying to work with and find out what needed to be changed to them and so um they sent me a couple things and i kind of the rest is history at that point it gave them some feedback on some new stuff they came out with and it just moved forward from there that's pretty cool they, that that got you into the industry and and you you mentioned matt francis um it helps to know people in this business. I mean, it just it just does. It's like anything else. Like the more people you know, the the more ends you're going to have. So I think I think that helps out a lot. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of industries that have you know anything to do with racing, any motorsport industry, sure. you know, things of this nature. It, it, a lot of it has to do with who you know and what they do and and who they might know, for example. Exactly. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, Matt's obviously back in the days was a super busy guy, He's, you know, always in the limelight, you know, did a lot of stuff, traveled all over the place, and uh, uh, I met him through another friend, and uh, him, Matt and my wife get along really well, and and uh, he was, Matt was kind of helping us with the hobby shop and trying to, to get that whole thing sorted out, and, and uh, Matt's been, you know, at the time was helping us out quite a bit, just, you know, showing us what we needed to do and what not to do, and and uh, it was pretty cool. I mean, yeah, knowing a lot of those guys and, and uh, yeah, especially, you know, where it leads to later down the road kind of helps because now when you talk to them, you know, they know you've been around for a long time as well. And, and there's a lot of mutual respect at that point, which yeah. helps in the long run for sure. So when uh, when you got to Tekin there, from what you just said briefly there, it's when you came on board as a driver – and they had just bought the company from from the previous owners. There was a bunch of merchandise that they had you test to see if it was worth keeping, or they wanted to come out with a new uh, new thing. Or how did that work? Yeah, I mean, basically, when when Jim and Sherry bought the company in 2004, we were all still racing brush motors. We still used you know nickel metals, and and everyone was still doing round cells. So this is before brushless and lipo, and so uh, they had a lot of you know Tekin. When it, when it was closed down originally, had a lot of cutting-edge designs. I mean, back when they, in the days, they were top level. I mean, and so what they had was a lot of products that never came to market, but the designs and a lot of the hardware was already done. And so they sent us, you know, what would, would be the current speed controller, and it actually worked really, really well. Uh, back then it was the G10, and then it quickly changed to the G11 because they changed a couple things on it, and that was Tekin's first, you know, 2004, 2005 top-of-the-line competition speed controller. And so um, kind of went from there, and uh, matter of fact, uh, MVG, my, my other real job before I was just on the team, I used to work for Chrysler, and so uh, one of the dealerships I was working with closed down, and I had about a, a month of free time before I was actually interested in even, you know, kind of going back to work, and uh, I ended up going up to Tekin to test some of the new brushless stuff they were working on at the time, so I actually, me and my family just kind of took a summer vacation up to Tekin for a month and, you know, went to the test track and ran brushless before it even existed in, as far as Tekin was concerned. So that's kind of where the whole relationship even got, you know, bigger at that point. That's funny that you mentioned the car dealership thing. Were you a salesman then? Or uh, No, I was an uh, auto tech. Oh, okay, okay. I, I had a car dealership for 10 years before I got involved in uh, RC cars. I figured the smaller cars were easier to work on. <laughs> Not as much problems. So now that's what I do. True. <laughs> now, uh, something, again, you just said here, lots of interesting stuff this evening. So you were, you were one of the first people to kind of get your hands on the brushless stuff. Coming from all the brush technology and the round cell batteries and all that kind of stuff, what were your first impressions of the brushless stuff? Did you think this was a fad, or did you think, hey, this is here to stay? Um, you know, initially it, was, it had the ability to be a fad, but the, the horsepower was excellent. I mean, you couldn't... You couldn't argue about the horsepower and the fact that the maintenance was basically missing. Again, you know more, you know, cutting brushes, cutting comms, and rebuilding the motor every two or three runs because at the time, that's what we did in Modified. I mean, you ran your car, modified one or two batteries, and you rebuilt the motor. So 
to know that I could run that same speed, battery pack after battery pack after battery pack, that was very interesting. Um, initially, though, the feel wasn't there. I mean, they didn't feel what we were used to racing. I mean, the, the, there was no drag to them. You know, they, the, 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 even just the, the, the clunkiness, essentially, of the, the, the controller and the motor combination, the, the software needed a lot of revising. I mean, it was good, but, like, especially on off-road, where if throttle control is so pinnacle is, is in the fast laps, you couldn't always guarantee you were going to come out of the corner in the same manner. And yeah, that's what, you know, basically smooth. took a lot of work. Yeah, it does. You know, even in, in, in the biggest problem actually initially was in-air car control. You just didn't have it. You know, the brush stuff almost felt very, very delayed as far as your input to what it actually put out. Now, what uh, what had to be done to start correcting some of those things? Uh, so you said there was no drag brake in the beginning. So that obviously that had to be added. How long before drag brake kind of made its way in? A drag brake was pretty much, well, at least on Tekin's part, was a pretty much simple just go to the engineers and say, hey, look, we need the speed controller to, to basically apply drag or brakes automatically. And that was something that, you know, you know, with a brush motor, especially at the stock level, you actually always had to creep. You didn't want drag, and so a lot of us were dialing it out. But with a mod brush motor, you know, the RPMs are so fast, and, and the weight of the armature was moving so quickly, it really wasn't a problem. And so, you know, that, that, that feature was just a matter of, hey, look, we need brakes to, when I let off the gas, brakes need to apply on their own. And then, you know, at that point, it's testing how much strength, the frequency of the braking power, you know, when it comes in, things of that nature. So a lot of it was... You know, being my my automotive background, that's actually what I did for Chrysler. I mean, I worked out of a dealership, but I had this unique position to where my position was I'm between the technicians and the actual engineers. And so I helped write the diagnostic software and interfaces between the two. So I had to talk to the mechanics and mechanic talk and then actually talk to the engineers and nerd talk and then make <laughs> them both work. That's and so awesome. I was already kind of, kind of a natural to it because, you know, Jim, the owner, is our head engineer. And so he, you know, he speaks, you know, nerd at the time. He was, you know, he he was into RC, but you know, he was buying this company to get into RC fully. And so, you know, what I'm relating to him as a driver, he hadn't quite grasped yet. And so it was kind of a, a, an interesting relationship for a while. But it was a lot of late night phone calls and saying, "Hey, look, this doesn't work, but change this," and and uh, it was just pretty cool. I know that a lot of people they don't they don't even understand how the drag brake works, but uh, I, we just we were going over this at the at our track. And uh, I was talking to a couple of people about it this this week, actually, Eric. And, yeah. And uh, some people were like, well, what's the benefits of it? And I like it. I, I When I first started, I didn't like it because I didn't understand it. And now um, I almost need to have drag brake in the car to set up for the sweeping corner. And, well, absolutely. And it's yeah, got, it's I important. have to have it. And if I don't run with it, it just seems like it runs too free. And I, it keeps the car planted on the on the track surface, it seems to me. And uh, that's that's pretty odd that you brought up the drag rig thing. So <laughs> that's awesome. Um, real quick before we move on with the uh, with the questions here for our listeners, if you have any questions for Randy Pike here, go ahead and give us a call at seven zero two seven three one one two three zero. I'm sure he'd love to have your questions. And uh, moving on here, Randy, another question. I know you said that you came on as a driver before the team manager position. Um, how long did you have to work? as a team driver what all was involved in that and what did they what did they see in you to move you up to team manager did uh did you knowing them kind of from the beginning when they brought you on have a, a big part to do with that yeah i think so you know, again at one point a few of us were sent some speed controllers to, to test and determine what we thought was different if anything and, and it, was, it was almost a blind test and at some point the long story short was that i didn't notice anything from the previous version like at all, I, to me it felt exactly the same. Motor temps were the same. I didn't notice anything different. And at the time, it was kind of a test for all the drivers, as, as Jim was trying to see who could actually feel a variance. And so all those quote unquote new speed controllers were still the old ones, just in a new box. <laughs> and so that was actually where the whole relationship started with a couple of us. So there was kind of this unsaid test team, and that coupled with the fact that. I did have this unique position, and I understood how to talk to the engineers in their format and the actual drivers kind of gave me this unique outlook on the way things were working. And so Jim was really in tune to that. And uh, he had came down for the Pavenats uh, that were hosted at Speed World Raceway, so he kind of stopped by. And we had dinner a couple nights, and he checked out the hobby shop, and I actually tuned up a couple stock motors for him and his son that were racing that race. And, uh, you know, again, he kind of saw that not only did I know what I was, was saying or I could you know, knew the information, that I could actually apply it. And so that was big for him. 
That's awesome. Now, real quick here, I'm I'm a little. Did you were you team manager or a, a team driver and still own your hobby shop at the same time, or were those different periods of time? Uh, I was uh, during the period of being a team driver. I owned the hobby shop. I kind of foresaw the the economy kind of going down, at least in my local area, and uh, I ended up closing the hobby shop after the third year. And so it was more or less where it wasn't really worth the extra, you know, because I had my current job at the time, and so my wife was managing the hobby shop along with the employees, and it was almost just a a constant break even. And so that was a lot of effort to put into something that really wasn't paying out. And so uh, as soon as I closed the hobby shop down, uh, there was another – the, the current team manager kind of uh, – him ended up parting ways with with Teakin, and that's when uh, the opportunity was, was offered to me by Jim. And so at the time, it was it was just something to do, you know, during the weekends on the side and, and kind of manage the team because it wasn't really a full-time position. Uh, there was a lot of work involved, but it was it was easy to manage just, um, you know, all my off time and something like that. So – because at the time, uh, I had a four-day schedule at work, so I had an extra work weekday, and it was pretty easy to, to balance, so – well, that's awesome. That's super cool. It's probably a lot easier than owning the the hobby store. Do you do you regret now leaving the hobby store since Short Course has been such a fad and and such a, a craze? And a, yeah, it, it, I mean it's crazy now. Do you regret that at all? Uh, no, because when I you know back when I owned the hobby shop, none of that stuff really existed. I mean, I, brushless had just hit right as I was closing down, and it was mostly in the mini phase when everyone was running 18th scale cars and. That was really the big thing when I first uh, when I ended up closing up shop. That and along with like the the T Max 3.3 had just coming out, and and uh, my, my local area was huge in rock crawling and monster trucks. If okay. it was big, fast, and loud, those guys ate it up, you know, all day long. And matter of fact, that's when the Baja 5 had just been released, and we sold five or six of those things. And then uh, shortly after that, it just wasn't making any sense. So, um, but yeah, I kind of missed the whole short course thing. I mean, uh, owning a hobby shop is is no joke. I mean, that, that no. has got to be one of the toughest, most cutthroat businesses I've ever been involved with. Yeah, it is. But and then you always have you always have people that, that want specific things, and maybe you can't order them at that moment, so they're going to try yeah. to go to your competitor or whatever. You know, it's just, it's tough. It's, you got to deal with finicky. Uh, finicky and complaints and the whole deal. If somebody blows up a, a system because it was their fault, they're going to blame it on you because you sold them the wrong thing or something. And uh, I, I just... <laughs> that never I, happens. I, I, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> never, never. Well, Shane, uh, you got a question for Randy? Here. Yeah, yeah. Randy, being the team manager for Teakin, are you included in the conceptual product ideas, or do you strictly test when something is sent your way? Um, no, I'm definitely um, in the conception area. Matter of fact, the SC4X was one of those You're projects ready. that I kind of uh, brought to the table and moved along just because I saw four-wheel drive short course becoming very, very large early on. I mean, I knew that two-wheel drive was huge, but I saw four-wheel drive at the time as being the – that was going to be the car and the platform that brought the average racer, the you know the average competition club level racer to short course. Because it was for me personally. When I drove a four wheel drive short course, I was like, yeah, this is this cool. This thing's hooked this up. Yeah, I can I can drive the, I can drive a lap. <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can drive a lap. I can actually get the front of the, the car to come down yep. when I hit the brakes instead of flying off the track. And and so for me at the time that you know I I didn't I just I just like short course a lot. I was a two wheel drive buggy, four wheel drive buggy driver. And a car that I could not control the attitude of in the air, that was a that was a, a toy. It's a problem. I wanted nothing yeah. to do with it. Yeah, I mean it was it was. And so when four wheel drive, you know, jamming and off and had their cars, I was like, you know what, this is going to be the class that brings all the racers to short course. And so we saw this you know, opportunity for having the 550 motors kind of come into this platform. And and so there's a lot of projects that from you know inception, conception, and design, I have my inputs because you know Tekin's. We make racing products and competition-level products. It, it's it's qu- high-end, it's quality, and it's everything about the design has a function. You know, we're we're smaller, we're lighter. You know, the the ability to update things, the the modes and the software usability, all of that stuff has a purpose. We're not really big into fluff. You know, if it's not a requirement, we don't usually try to put it in there, um, and that's kind of what we're known for. So, being the team manager, I have so much direct input from. You know, our team drivers, you know, some of the, even the pro guys that choose to run our stuff, like Atsushi Hara, um, all the crawler guys from Axel, Scott Hughes, and Bender. I mean, I talk to these guys on a regular basis, so if they say, hey, look, we want to do this, we kind of want a product that, that will fit this application, and nothing exists, then we, we, you know, we kind of pursue that project and move forward. Yeah, you, you and you as a racer know 
pretty much what they're talking about because you race yourself. So you kind of yep. know exactly what's going on. And every product I've seen from Tekken has been at the top, top of the notch. charts. Every single product that since I started RC cars, it's been the cream of the crop. We'll see. And I didn't, I didn't know that about you, Randy, that you, you had a direct, um, you know, included in the conceptual stuff going on. But I see now why Tekken is, is so far advanced in the game with the stuff they put out. And we'll get into it later questions, but I know even things with your speed controls, the, you know, being able to check your sensor wire, sensor board by spinning your motor I and seeing yeah. the little, le you know, lights blink and that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, the average consumer might not know that, but that's stuff that can really sway someone's mind. Um, what other little little knickknacks, little things like that might uh, consumers uh, not be aware of? That's actually probably one of the biggest. I mean, the sensor checker feature on the RS, RS Pro, and RX-8 was, was something that we kind of looked at early on. You know, not a lot of the controllers have seven LEDs for a display. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's a lot of lights to show and, and control. And, and one of the things that we learned early on was that we kind of looked at the, the other competitors and, you know, if the sensor harness didn't work or if the sensor board and the motor went bad, you really couldn't tell. There was no, there was no test. There was no. And it's a big deal. Control. It's a big t It's a big deal too, because yeah. you, sometimes you don't know exactly what's wrong with the system if it doesn't, if it's not working properly. And usually, it's simple as putting a new sensor wire on it. Like the sensor wire is disconnected, and you can't tell that exactly. with any other system. Well, and, and on top of that, we have a unique, you know, I would say, you know, problem or feature where because we can run censored and censorless on the fly. Uh, you know, it was one of those things where we had a sensor harness come unplugged during a test, and none of us realized it. All we all noticed was that the car feels weird. It kind of feels a little bit slower. I don't feel connected to the car, and obviously once we take the car off the track and look at it... Sensor wire was gone. You know, hey, look, this is off, yeah. you know, and, and so, you know, how could the end user actually find out what's going wrong here? And so that's how we ended up saying, hey, look, we've got some LEDs. Can we use this? And so that's what we've done. So... Yeah, the RS sensor checker and you know, RX-8 as well is it's probably one of the coolest features that people don't utilize all the time because not only can you check it to the motor that's, that's actually wired up to as far as the ABC wires go, yeah. you can grab anybody's motor loose and simply plug in just the sensor harness to test it. And I've done that at huge national events and just saying, hey, look, can you check my sensor board? And they expect me to whip out this you know, crazy-looking tool or <laughs> scope or something like that. And I go, no, just let me plug it into my car, and, and I'll spin it, and I'll tell you for sure, you know, and... That's a pretty cool thing. Uh, next to that, I would probably say the onboard temp sensor. The onboard temp sensor, I use a lot. I I run it in my Mugen and my e in the Eco that I run, and uh, I definitely needed it this weekend. I needed to know how hot that that uh, the the speed control got before it got right. to, you know before it got too hot that it would shut down because we were running. I don't know, what was it twelve? 14 minutes at the gas oh, wow. champs that's, in electric. That's a long electric run. Yeah, and everybody was like, oh my gosh, my battery's going to die, this and that. And I actually, I had a 5200 pack in the car, and it barely made, you know, the 15-minute mark on, a big, on yeah. a big track like that. And then when it would come off, it instantly tells you the temperature by the lights that blink on the LEDs on the speed control. And that's a pretty cool feature. That I like that neat. a lot. That's very neat. Now, are you able to switch that between Fahrenheit and Celsius? No, no, it's just, it's blinks. Um, no, it's it's limited to Fahrenheit, but the biggest thing is it's not so much that you're looking for a numeric, no. uh, you know, relationship yeah. to the LED. There's seven LEDs, and yeah. so what you're looking for is to make, like, for an example, on an eight-scale run, my recommendation 99% 90, of the time is go run the car. If at 10 minutes you're at six LEDs or cooler, you're fine. You're going to not thermal the unit, you know, because, like, RX-8 doesn't necessarily require a fan. I don't run them most of the time, and so... That's really the kicker because the heat sink might read 20 to 30 degrees different with a temp gun than the microchip is, and that's really what is controlling the thermal ability of the controller. The internals, and that's yeah. That's actually where the, it's internal. So it's reading microchip temp off of that unit and displaying it on the LEDs. And so seven, the unit can thermal at 240 degrees, which is really hot. But nine times out of ten, the average eight-scale driver, as long as their setup's proper, you know, gearing and their speed controller settings aren't crazy, most of the time they don't need the fan. And so as long as your six LEDs are lower after a full run, whether it's 10, 12, whatever minutes you run, you're fine. You're not, you're, yeah. you're you know, 40 degrees off from thermaling, so. I actually got to thermal it at Hot Rod Hobbies at the uh, Hot Rod Shootout uh, this year. Uh, it was 100-plus it was degrees 
you know, high humidity. And I realized my fan wasn't hooked up and there's not really much airflow underneath my body. And, and we were running on a small track like that. So you're trying to, you're right. trying to ask a whole lot out of the system in a short period of time. And it, it definitely got hot and thermaled on me. And I wondered if, it, you know, did the, did something come undone or something happen? But uh, normally that thing never thermals out. And I knew I'm, the fan didn't work. So uh, it, it, it got yeah. hot. But yeah. other than that, well, I, I have not. When the, when, the fan doesn't, when the fan doesn't work, actually, it actually does more damage than good. So, I mean, because it's just not letting any airflow hit the heat sink. And so. Yeah, if, it's blocking if you're, it if you're off. That day, yeah, exactly. Pull that fan out of there and, and get rid of it if you don't have anything to replace it with. Yeah, so. yeah. I didn't even know. I actually walked up to uh, somebody there from Tekin. I, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but uh, they helped me out and gave me a fan. And uh, it, the thing was dialed in the rest of the weekend. I think I took uh, second or third at that race. That's so awesome. it, was, nice. it, was, it was pretty good. I was happy. Well, uh, moving on with the questions, before we hit this next question again, if we have any callers listening in, uh, the number is 702-731-1230. Um, also, if you have something you'd like to email us a question or something you'd like to see added, it is rcracechat at gmail.com. And uh, moving on with the questions here, we're kind of talking about testing and that kind of stuff, Randy. Do you do you have your entire team focusing on testing certain items, or when they're at these events, do you let them run whatever they think is going to make them the most competitive? Um, it kind of depends on the driver and the event. Um, so a lot of the times, you know, as far as testing goes, I'll have a certain group of drivers test certain things. So, for example, if I've got a software that really needs to be tested in, like, an on-road genre or application, then I have a group of guys that I give it to because that's all they do. They specify an on-road racing so they can give me the feedback I need. If I have, you know, another set of software that's more of an off-road feature or something that we need the feedback on on that, it's a different group of guys, you know. So it really, you know, I, I try to keep this a small group of guys that I that give me consistent feedback, that have access to the tracks, especially ones that have access to a closed track because a lot of the stuff these guys test isn't, you know, doesn't come to the public for months. You know, it could be half a year even. So it really depends on what we're doing. So when you're when you're at these big events, then the the priority for you guys might not necessarily be to test a product or or figure something out, but just to go out there and place as best as possible for publicity for Tekin then because you have separate yeah. times to do your testing. Yeah, ideally, we don't like testing at an event unless it's basically we've gotten to the point where that's the only place left left to test. You know, the IIC is a perfect example of that. There's not too many places where you can get a carpet on-road track to have that much grip. There's pretty much the IIC race and then Snowbirds. Aside from that, the carpet guys rarely get that level of grip on a track. And then on top of that, have all the fast guys in one place. And so that's a pretty big deal. And so sometimes we will test new stuff at the race, but we just won't say anything. A lot of times <laughs> we won't tell anybody. And again, though, this only occurs in the classes that it's legit in. You can't do it in a non-timing class. You can only do it in an open class. And so a lot of times you know, we, we prefer not to test in an event because a lot of those racers are there to compete, yes. and that's the wrong time to ask them to change. Yeah, nobody wants to try no something new and good. different at a, at a big yeah, event. Exactly. They want to they wanna win. <laughs> And yes. uh, real quick here, we have a caller, Chris. What's going on? Hi, how's it going, guys? Excellent. How's it going, Chris? What's going on? Very good. Um, I have a just a technical question that other listeners might be interested in. Um, I've been running the RS Pro without the power capacitor. Somehow I installed it in my buggy, and I've been running it, um, I don't know, maybe several months now. And uh, somebody yesterday when I was at the track practicing pointed out to me that I didn't have the capacitor on there, so I just installed it today. But I was just wondering, um, like, what kind of a difference should I expect to see in the speed controller's performance now that I put that capacitor on there? Um, the, the whole point of the capacitor on the RS, RS Pro, FXR, B1R, is to handle what's called ripple current. Ripple current is... The, you know, the spike you get from throttle applications, motor loads, things of this nature. And it, so basically, it's there to buffer the uh, up and down of the voltage rail from the battery in the, in the load. So if the cap's gone, the speed controller often runs a lot hotter than it should. And so because that ripple current's got to go somewhere. And if the cap's not in, in place, that speed controller consumes that power. And so you should notice, you know, a little bit smoother performance. You really probably won't notice anything as far as motor temperature change goes, but you might notice the crispness of the throttle is back. And so you really should never operate an RS or an RS Pro without a cap, period. Uh, there's, it's there for a reason. Go ahead. I'm sorry. 
Oh, I was just going to say that that's wonderful because I, as far as I can tell, that was, this was my first brushless system ever, and I thought it worked perfectly. And so if I'm if I should expect a you know better performance from it, I'm just curious to see how it's going to go next time I put it on the track. And Chris, the whole time you had that speed control, there was no capacitor on it. There was no capacitor. Wow. I had it. Uh, yeah, I had the 10.5 uh, Tegan Redline motor in there, geared 81. Uh, 24 in the in the B4 buggy. That's amazing. With, uh, if if I would have yeah. ran that on some other system and the capacitor was off, I think it would have fried instantly. Because I've yeah. had I've had them come off and it fries the speed control. So that's, yeah, so that's just another performance value of the Tekken system. Yeah, that absolutely. thing is just cream of the crop, man. Like you can't get Top anything of the better. Line race gear. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that's, that's something other, that we kind of that's something that we kind of work on. We don't like running any of our products. To where they're at the edge, you know. If like like the RX-8 is another example of that. You can run an RX-8 without a fan in 95% of the applications, 95% of the time. We designed it that way on purpose because if you know, no one wants to lose their A main win because a fan broke. Yeah. And uh, by the way, about the the capacitor, I'm not sure if the one that I put on there is uh, actually the right one. I found it in my toolbox, and I don't know if it made its way in there from the package because I checked the package and I didn't see one. And I think. You know, I don't know if it's possible that maybe it didn't come with the speed controller. But anyways, the power capacitor that I put on there, it's a smaller one. And I think it's one that you would find, like, you know, I used to run the brushed Novak, and it's one of the mm -hmm. smaller power capacitors. Would it really make any difference? or? Yeah, the the capacitor that comes with the Tekken RS RS Pro is a uh, a very low ESR cap. And what that means is, is that it responds and absorbs quickly to that ripple current and that's the kind of benefit that's why our cap for example is so much smaller than some of our competitors caps we don't you know they have we kind of joke and call it the giant trash can cap but basically ours is very very small um the cap you should be looking for should have markings of 16 volts and you'll see a marking that says 330 uf and it should be silver and it should have a blue uh, marking for the negative side on it um, if you need to see a picture of it you should be able to look at your instruction manuals and see that um, I really recommend if it's not the right cap or if you're not sure, um, definitely make sure you go get the right cap. That part number is a TT3520, and it'll come with a two-pack just so you have a spare. Okay. And actually, as you were telling me, give me the description. I'm looking at it right now, and it's like 680 micro frequency 16 volt is what I see on it. Does that, does that uh, differ? I'm not sure the frequency range. Let me snag one really quick. Look at that. Where else? Where else other than Tekken? Right on the radio kind of show. Right on yeah. the radio. Customer yeah, bust service. Bust out the manual. But put it in. Install it. <laughs> Randy will probably hook it up for you over the air. That would be awesome. <laughs> uh, the cap should say like a, um, a P uh, P S zero six seven three three zero sixteen volt. And so if it doesn't say that, it's not the right cap. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's saying sixteen volt. And 680 micro frequency or something like that. Well, I'll tell you what, Chris, you can come on down to the Vegas RC Raceway and we can get you one of those shiny caps. Definitely. definitely. So you, All right. you mosey on down in the morning and I'll take care of you on that one. Um, okay, I'll like, see you guys. Thank you so much for calling there, Chris. Appreciate it. We have Kevin on the line. Kevin, what's going on? What's up, buddy? Hey, Kevin. How's it going, Kevin? Not bad, not bad. You guys got great faces for the radio. Wonderful, wonderful. You have a, uh, you have a question <laughs> for, uh, for Randy. Um, just a couple quick questions. I know you guys say that the RS runs down to a 6.5, I believe, or 5.5. Five. Um, I tried running a 7.5, and it just turned was out, even with two capacitors on it. I'm um, wondering what your thoughts are on that. What car is it in? It's in a B4. You should be okay at a B4. Um, the original ratings were uh, all aimed towards two-wheel drive cars at the time the speed controller was designed. And we've kind of gone to a point where because the RS RS Pro line is over three years old and so many of the platforms have changed from one car to the next and the weights have changed and battery power has changed since they were originally designed, we kind of had to go back and redo some of our specs because the cars have gotten you know faster, the battery power has gotten better, customers are expecting more from the car. So with a, a, a B4, an RS and a 7.5 should be just fine. So do me a favor when you get time. Uh, email me at rpike at teamteakin.com with your gearing and your, and your speedo settings so I can help you get that sorted out because even especially with two caps, it should not thermal. 
So we we're, we're might be missing something on a setting or a setup somewhere. So. Okay, I will do that. Also, what are your recommendations on uh, um, the SC10 4x4 for the um, Pro 4 motors? What, what's the recommendation on the size? Um, it, uh, the, my first question, when I always get this question, is how big is the track that you race at most frequently? So which track do you race at? Are you racing in the Vegas RC or where are you racing? Yes, the Vegas RC race. Uh, that's that's an indoor track, so for 90% of the indoor tracks that I've ever been to, I would run a 4,000 kV, especially in the Associated. It's one of the lighter trucks in the in the market, uh, right up there with the Durango. It's sub six pounds when it's all loaded up. The 4,600 is drivable, but for lap times, you will be faster with the 4,000. Okay, cool. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, you Thanks awesome, for awesome. Thank Thanks you for so much in. for calling in there, Kevin. And real quick, we just got our first shipment of Pro 4 Motors in at the Vegas RC Raceway. I know I had uh, eight of them this morning, and I think I have one left there in the pro shop. So if you hurry down, you might be able to get it from Amber if you're real nice to her. I saw those things in the in the case this morning, and, and they look nice. They are mighty sassy. I have the 5.5 uh, the turn, the 4X motor in uh in my associated 4x4 right now and you see me driving that thing and i'm, I'm itching to grab one out of the case yeah i got i got the bug you gotta for try it, it out you yeah. gotta you gotta do some personal testing gotta be able to tell them what's going on but uh looks like we have a couple more questions we're getting close to the end of the show here so shane why don't you go ahead and move on yeah randy for the listeners that might be looking for a sponsorship what are some of the things that tekin and yourself look for as a in a, in a prospect and go, go ahead i'll let you answer that one first <laughs> <laughs> um, biggest thing for us is is kind of local presence and making sure you're a good person. I mean, this it's it's one thing to be fast. I mean, fast racers sell products. It's the whole what wins on Sunday sells on Monday thing. But for us, we we've been a big thing about grassroots. Grassroots as far as helping each other at the track, being not necessarily the fastest guy, but maybe the guy that helps everyone out when they need it. You know, a lot of times some of the pro ra- pro racers at the top level, they're you know they've kind of got this cloak around them where. You know, they're not approachable. I don't want to bug him, and, and that's great for some times. But considering that we need, you know, a lot of our team guys out there for product support, that's a bad thing. You know, I was at a re- perfect example. I was at a race with Ryan Lutz, and he's a team Durango driver, and no one was talking to him about the Durango problems they were having. Uh, they were coming to me for it just because they happened to be driving the cars. And so it was one of those things where that was a perfect example of that. I'm they, not even on the team at the time, and they should be asking him for it, but they were so scared to bug him. They're afraid to approach the, the factory guy, it seems like. <laughs> And, I mean, even me, I, 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 I hate to ask him questions. I feel like I'm bothering somebody. And uh, really, that's what they're there for, I would assume, you know. And, and, but still, people have the jitters of asking the Ryan Cavaliers and, and Ryan Lutz. I know that Ryan Lutz, actually, he'll probably give you a whole story. On, he'll give you a whole write-up on it because everything I see that guy put on the Internet, he, he writes a story about it. And uh, yeah. I, I actually like Ryan a lot. Now, so it sounds like you guys are looking for more of a, an ambassador to the hobby rather than someone that, that goes out of town to all these events, or do they need to go out of town and be an ambassador? Can they kind of be a, a home track hero type person, or do you look for someone that goes out of town? Uh, we look for both. I mean, we, we like to have a balanced team. And so ideally what I kind of shoot for as a manager is I look at the kind of rural regions, for example, and I'm looking for a small handful of guys that can fill up a rural region in their area who probably tra- minimally travel at least to their local, you know, in, within their local region, all the local tracks, and they're an ambassador for a sport. Because what I don't want to do is have, you know, a, a top pro guy and, and no one else in the area because no one's going to want to talk to him. They're scared of him, you know. It's, and Ryan Lutz, like I said, is one of the nicest guys I've ever met in RC, and he's totally easy to talk to. Yes. But, again, it's just a, this whole, you know, perception that, hey, I don't want to bug him. He's working. And so we've got a balance of guys. I mean, we have Ryan Lutz on the team. We've got Rhonda Drake on the team, uh, Josh Wheeler, you know, all these guys top level. But at the same time, we've got a nice big group of, of balanced racers that might be the home track hero. You know, they might be that guy in his local area who's the fastest guy in the area, but for because of work or finances or whatever, doesn't get to travel out as much as he would like to. And so we've got a lot of a lot of those guys as well. And for me, it's all about product knowledge and being able to help the customers at the track. That's a huge factor. It also helps to be fast. But you know, I'll take a guy who's very very helpful and can support the Tiki guys that are using it over the fastest guy at the track who just doesn't want to talk to anybody. Definitely, definitely. Now, let me, uh, let Everyone me has their you, egos. Go ahead. Yeah, go let, ahead. Me, let me ask you this, because so, a certain person <laughs> comes to mind when I say it. Now, do you guys look for a certain age group when you guys are doing the sponsorship kind of thing, or are you looking for 18 and above, or what's, what's kind of the age group with that? Um, I, I don't necessarily look at the age group so much. For me, it's, 
it's a matter of the whole package. So if I love I love helping the young young drivers out, especially with their family supporting them and stuff like that, because if you can get them young and you can keep them, you know, where they enjoy the hobby, they'll often turn into some of the best ambassadors. I mean, I used to know Mark and Matt Francis back in the days when we were all kids. I mean, they're a little older than I am, but at the same time, I remember them as kids. You know, I watched them tear apart this one kid from out of town. They completely rebuilt his associated buggy and you know everything for him and they didn't get they wanted anything in return you know there was no problem the dad tried to offer him money the whole thing and they were just happy to help and so you know i can get that from any age group i can get that from a 14 year old kid who just loves this this hobby to death or i can get it from a 50 year old guy who's you know on the on the road to retirement and and just again loves this hobby if for him it's like golf you know, it's just one of those things where they just enjoy it so much. And that, that's a really rare thing to find. It's even more rare to find that and they're fast. So for me, the, the success I've had with the team is it's just finding that balance. You know, I'm looking for two or three guys in the area that are, you know, maybe I'll, between the two or three, I'll get the whole package out of the three. And so, you know, we don't sponsor a ton of guys. I know that's probably a question that a lot of people ask. You know, how many guys are sponsored? Well, I'm faster than this guy. It's not always about being fast for me. It, it's having the balance. You know, for, for me, it's – it's. It, it, I often look for the guys who put down references from the hobby shop owners and the track guys because I'll call them. Make no mistake about it. I'll call every reference you have on that list until I find the information that I want. And if I don't find it, I might call around the local area and talk to the tracks that you might not have put down as a reference just to kind of find out what to kind of person you are. see who you are and what kind of person you yeah, – how do you absolutely. act. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I'm, I'm kind of old school when it comes to that. I mean, it's – you know, back in the days, to, to be sponsored was huge. I mean, that was – It still is, you know, I think. Everyone, I think it is too, but I think it's kind of lost some of its panache to it. Is where there's a lot of 50 deals out there. There's a lot of you know, hey, I just get a discount, and and we don't do that. I mean, we do have levels of driving and levels of sponsorship, but none of them are like a 50 off thing. That that's not what we're into. We're into putting into it as much as you're racing as you're putting into it, uh, racing our products. I know that there's a lot of guys out there that have sponsorships that probably shouldn't have sponsorships. I mean, the way they act, the way their 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 mentality is on the driver's stand and what they do off the driver's stand and stuff like that. There's there's probably a bunch of people that shouldn't let have any kind head. of yeah, yeah, they let it go to their head. They think that they're the best and then you try to approach them and ask them a question just like Randy was saying and some people aren't approachable and these are the the smaller guys these aren't the big guys on the, the kahunas. Yeah, yeah so they think there's something special and it has it boosts their ego up and then all of a sudden you can't even talk to them and right. I don't think those guys should have any kind of sponsorships no no well yeah right. and then you know as a team manager that's kind of hard to balance sometimes it is cuz you don't know you might not know those people yeah. Yeah, I can't travel to every track or to every region all the time, no. and so I, I use a lot of the references. You know, I'll talk to the hobby shop owners and the guys that run the races and say, hey, look, would would you, you know, give this guy a discount? If you were in my shoes, would you sponsor him? And I take that opinion very heavy. And if they say, no, not really, you know, he's kind of obnoxious, he cusses a lot, or, you know, he's just not the greatest guy, I, I'm done with it. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be one opinion because if one guy thinks that of you, there's going to be ten other guys that think Somebody too. else does, too. And so, yeah. Well, yeah. that's, that's awesome information. Now, real quick, I know we, we just have a couple minutes left here. I, I'm dying to get this out, though. But, you know, until now, Tekken's kind of used that 4X series motor, the one that you said you designed, and now they're releasing the, the Pro 4 motors. Um, what, what can customers expect to see different between the two motors, and why would they cho uh, choose one over the other? Uh, originally, the SE4X was designed based off of uh, the current, what was going to, we, we was, were told was going to be the current, you know, legal design for the four-wheel drive short course class. And so we, after testing and everything like that, it was good, but it wasn't as good as we knew it could be. And so at that point, we set out to design the motor that we felt would be perfect for the application. You know, we went and took our T8 design for our eight scales and kind of scaled it down to where it would fit in that package. And what we ended up with was a motor, the, you know, was the, was the Pro 4. It's 540 in length. It's a four-pole motor. It's Two and a little over two ounces lighter weight, which that which that whole class really needs. It's a little heavy, and so anytime you can shed weight, especially ounces, it's a benefit to the class. And so, you know, we did, we did some testing with a lot of testing with Ryan Lutz. I mean, he was, you know, because he's ten minutes from my house, I get to test with him a lot, and his feedback is huge. 
you know, we went out and tested that, and, and both of us just were happy with that design. And so, what you can, the, there's, they're kind of two different motors that both work equally well. For example, the Roar Nationals with TQ we, with we're an getting, We're getting down. We have about 30 seconds left here, Randy. Don't mean to cut you off on that one, bud. Terribly sorry. That was that was an absolutely yeah, we, fabulous we can interview. Keep going on this interview. We can interview. keep going with you forever. Um, real quick, thank you so much for, for calling in, and uh, we do appreciate the interview. And if you have anything to check out for Tekken, it's teamteekin.com. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank Sorry you, for Randy. cutting off right there. And uh, I think we got a few seconds left. Catch us next week. Got a real big show for you next week, Tuesday, 7 p.m. Thank you. Tune in. by Dollar Loan Center. Visit them at don'tbebroke.com and keep it right here for dates and times of your favorite games. The NFL, Dollar Loan Center, and KLAV. This is gonna be good. Just win, baby. Hi, I'm Duke Libertori. And I'm Dr. Jan McBaron. We are a husband and wife team. And together we host the number one health talk show in the nation, Duke and the Doctor. You can hear our show weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. here on KLAV 1230 a.m. We'll discuss up-to-date health news, give away gifts, share in a laugh or two, and answer health questions from our callers. Feel happy, healthy, and terrific when you tune in to Duke and the Doctor. Monday through Friday from 6 to 8 a.m. on KLAV 1230 a.m., the talk of Las Vegas. Hi, my name is Gary Bridges, and I am the Home Pro Inspector. Join me every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Each week, I'm going to take you on an inspection of a home we have here in the Las Vegas area. We will discuss the inspection points we observe and the common safety and hazardous defects we find. I'll explain everything you need to know about what is behind the walls, up in the attic, in your yard, and the systems that operate your home. So join me on the Home Pro Inspector every Wednesday at 1 p.m. and have a safe and happy home. Hey there, lovebirds. This is Brian Mills for the Viva Las Vegas Wedding Show. Join me every Wednesday from 3 to 4 right here on KLAV as we talk all things weddings in Las Vegas. We have traditional weddings, Elvis weddings, theme weddings, receptions, helicopter weddings. That's all right here from 3 to 4 on KLAV. The Viva Las Vegas Wedding Show is brought to you by the Viva Las Vegas Wedding Chapel. Check out all their wedding packages on VivaLasVegas.com. Hi, I'm Renee, and this is my daughter, Jessica, and we're estate liquidators and have a 12,000 square foot antique and collectible consignment store. And we're going to be on every other Thursday at 1 p.m. to talk about ways you can discover if the items you have been holding on to are trash or treasure. In the meantime, you can visit our store at 1422 Western Avenue. Not just antique smart, filled with some of the treasures we're talking about. So if you have any items or questions, you can call in during our show every other Thursday at 1 p.m. Hi, this is Todd Barton with the Barton Bishop Real Estate Group. Join our team at 11 a.m. every Friday on KLAV for How It Works in Real Estate. And this is Chris Bishop with the Barton Bishop Real Estate Group. We will be discussing short sales, bank-owned properties, and other hot topics. Discuss with our guests each week. And I'm Amy with the Barton Bishop Real Estate Group. Join our team every Friday at 11 a.m. on KLAV for How It Works in Real Estate. Hi, this is Tiffany Rose Thomas. Join me and custom tattoo artist and local celebrity Jerry Thomas, owners of Lucky Cat Tattoo in Las Vegas. Every Friday night at 8 p.m., we will be bringing to you a fun show inspired by the excitement of the body art industry, custom tattoos, special guests, and more. Join Lucky Cat Tattoo's Ink Session, hosted by myself, Tiffany Rose Thomas, and custom tattoo artist Jerry Thomas every Friday night at 8 p.m. on KLAV.
Hi, join the Real Liberty Hour with Brent Jones and me, Jesse Law, on Tuesdays from 6 to 7 p.m. where we'll discuss overregulation and our vanishing freedoms and give you the tools to restore liberty right here at home. Be enlightened with guests, controversy, empowerment. And hey, if you want to chime in, you can give us a call on air. Catch the Real Liberty Hour each and every Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. right in your drive time and connect with us online at www.n4l.com. That's nforl.com. Here we go. Hi, I'm Eric. And I'm Shane. Listen to Radio Controlled Race Chat every Tuesday from 7 to 8 p.m. for all your RC-related information. From pro driver interviews to product reviews and tech tips, Radio Controlled Race Chat covers every aspect of the newest sport to sweep the nation. Catch Radio Controlled Race Chat every Tuesday from 7 to 8 p.m. starting September 13th. Or stream us live on the Vegas RC Raceway website, www.thevrcr.com. Again, that's www.thevrcr.com. Love us on radio, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. We are KLAV 1230 AM. You're listening to KLAV Las Vegas.